I began my career in data. I started out working as a data analyst and business intelligence specialist. In fact, here at CBT Nuggets, the very first content I ever recorded was on business intelligence and data analytics tools, Tableau and Power BI. So when this little topic popped up on the DevCore Blueprint, I felt very strongly and very personal that this topic was really meant for me because I have years and years and years of experience working with databases. Now, here's the thing. We're definitely going to cover what the exam wants us to do. By the end of this skill, you will know exactly what a relational database is, what a document database is, graph database, columnar database, and time series database. You'll know all of those things rock solid. But what I also want you to take away from this skill is what is database work like in the real world? Here's the thing. Here's the big spoiler. It's not just something that you slap on to the end of your application and hope that it stores data. The data is state is actually gigantic. And within the database world, there are many different types of jobs that people fill just to support one particular aspect of an application, the database. So in the next nugget, we're actually going to talk about what the data estate and the database world is really like out there. So that way, when you get out there in the real world, you'll actually know not only how to develop an application with a database backend, but also what types of databases are we going to have to support and the different teams that we're going to have to work with. Get ready, this one's gonna be huge and it's gonna be a lot of fun. Let's get going. I've said this probably 20 times throughout my content in CBT Nuggets and I'm going to say it again. A business's most valuable asset is their data. And I know that everybody's like, wait a minute, no, people are their most valuable asset. Yes, people are extremely valuable, but I would make the argument that in some businesses' cases, if they lost all of their data today with no backups, they weren't able to restore, that'd be it. That'd be it for the business. They'd be done. If they lost all their people, they could go out and recruit new people very quickly and get some sort of operation up and running, even if it's bad for a while. So data, I think, is really where it all starts. And why is that? Why is data so stinking important? Because it tells us exactly how the business is doing. It tells us the direction that the business is going in. So there's a whole lot of aspects that come into running a database and then turning that into a data ecosystem. And that's what this nugget's all about. This nugget, we're actually gonna be talking about what databases do and what types of databases there are and what types of people support all the different aspects of a data ecosystem. Let's get going. So if you've been following along on our playlist, these are the three components that you've seen when we were talking about the core structure of an application. You've got the front end web application. This is gonna be what our end users see and access, or this could be an API. This is what other programs are gonna be accessing. Then it flows into an application tier where it validates data and performs multiple other actions like communicating to a credit card processing thing or a shipping and handling application but then it all ends up here in a database and if you think if you just look at this at the most simplest form you're thinking okay well there's three quick pieces i can slap together like a front end a middle tier and then a database and this goes back to that monolithic architecture that we were talking about right all three of these components could quickly be spun up and thrown together in a monolithic application, and we even demonstrated that in the previous nugget when we just spun up Visual Studio and created an ASP.NET app. This skill, though, is all about focusing in on this core component. And this diagram, if we're just looking at these three pieces, is again very misleading because there's a lot more that goes on under the hood for each one of these items here. We even broke it apart when we were talking about other architectures like the services architecture or the microservices architecture. And then we threw up this diagram to talk about how a globally distributed application that's hosted in the Azure cloud would actually work. We saw traffic flow in from anywhere across the world. It was directed to the correct data center, load balance across the web tier, load balance across the app tier, and then all roads point to one single database. And this right here is where you think the buck stops, right? The data sits here and that's the end of it, right? Wrong. This is only the beginning of our data journey. Immediately, just looking at this one application, there are already database considerations that we need to make here. This Cosmos DB is what's called a document DB. This is something we're gonna be talking about in just a couple nuggets, but it's really cool because it's globally distributed and globally replicated. But what 
happens to the data from there? Who runs this database? And think about what I said in the intro nugget. The most important thing about our data is that we, you know, use it. We analyze it. We see what's happening within our business and predict where we're going to go. That sets up the data estate. In our data journey, when we see the application stops right here, the data estate is just beginning right here. Check this out. This is a real world picture of how a data estate and data actually flows in the real world. Now this database right here, like the CRM database, you should imagine that app tier sitting in front of this and the web tier sitting in front of this, and then maybe you had the load balancers and the DNS and everything like that. The same thing here, you've got an app tier here and a web tier here and an app tier here and a web tier here. This is kind of where the data estate begins is with what's called our transactional databases. These databases like our CRM, like our billing app, like our ERP app, or even just our custom web-based app that we're using to create and generate sales or something that's gonna be using our API. These databases are transactional, meaning they are all about writing new data to disks, writing new data to the database. And it's gonna be used primarily for updating data and primarily used for deleting data. The entire point is that this database is changing frequently. Now you knew I was gonna go back to Amazon at some point, right? Think about the amount of transactions that take place on Amazon every second, every millisecond. That's why we have the transactional databases up front because these transactional databases are optimized for writing workloads. They have different mechanisms or strategies that we can implement on these databases that make it better for them, to make it better for the database to work directly with the disks, the actual disk subsystems themselves that optimize them for writing data. So we have all of these different applications spread out all over the world doing different things. We need to analyze this data. So our next step is to aggregate all of this data into one gigantic database called the Data Workhouse. And you see this key term right here, ETL. That is extract, meaning we're extracting data out of each of these databases, transform, Meaning if we have to reshape the data or change the data on the fly, we'll transform it. A perfect example is let's pretend our CRM app carries gender data in it. It may use one for male and zero for female. Our billing app, however, may also keep up with gender for whatever reason, but let's say it uses M or F. When it comes time to load all of this data into the database, we need to standardize these somehow. That's where the transform comes in. The transform can say, if we've got a one, turn it into an M, or if we've got a zero, turn it into an F. And then lastly, there's L for load. We tell the ETL application specifically where to load this data. So this data warehouse is all about housing the majority of our data in one place so that we can quickly analyze it because instead of having to go to each of these different databases, it's all already here. Beyond that, we've optimized it for read heavy workloads. So over here, we have transactional databases. These are actually called OLTP databases. And in the data warehouse, we have a read heavy database, which is for analysis. That's what the A in OLAP stands for. At the end of the day, this data warehouse is still just storing raw data. So sometimes that data needs additional shaping or aggregations or calculations done to it to help us create quick reports and analytics. And that's what cubes do for us. In the data world, cubes really aren't used anymore. They're not really called cubes anymore. This is now really called data modeling. And data modeling is now contained within, it's now a feature of applications like Tableau or Power BI. So you could kind of look at the purple and the reporting stuff here as one section. So here we've actually, we've got, if I clear the screen, we've actually talked about three different roles or three different sections here within the data estate. We have the transactional databases here, which is going to be what's sitting at the back of our application. If I bring up this diagram one more time, you can now clearly see that our Cosmos DB document database here is a transactional database. 
And switching back to this diagram, you now clearly see once it's in Cosmos DB or the transactional database, in order for us to correctly analyze this data, it needs to go through some processes where we're going to be pulling data out of all of our different databases from all of our different applications, loading them into a warehouse, which stores all of the raw data, and then shaping that data so that it can be analyzed, which we called data modeling. Do you see now why I'm trying to take the time to do this? If I were just to teach you what a document database is and what it does, you would never actually know that there's this whole data estate thing going on behind the scenes where we're trying to pull data out of many different databases, shove them into a warehouse, and then analyze them. But these are real careers that people dedicate their entire lives to doing. In fact, I would argue that some of the database people that I've worked with in the past are so incredibly good and create such sophisticated solutions that they are on par with, say, the CCIEs of the networking world. This is really, really incredible and powerful stuff, and there are a lot of conferences like SQL Saturday that are dedicated to just nothing but database technologies. So now what you really need to start thinking about is what is the network that supports all of these different databases and all of the moving data that goes on, and who are the people that I interact with on a daily basis? And this sets up a really good point. First of all, what is the networking need of these databases. The databases rely on something that is absolutely crucial to make them work, especially as the application grows and grows and grows, and that is IOPS. It needs to have a fast connection to the sub-storage. In the actual architecture of a database, you may install something like a SQL Server on a VM, but that VM actually communicates over a network to something like a SAN, where all the disk sub-storage is. The throughput that has to take place in this network connection must be maxed out. We need to have the biggest MTU possibly allowable so that the SQL Server can send the most amount of data as possible in one block or read the most amount of data as possible in one block from the SAN. And who is responsible for maintaining the database? Who is responsible for developing the applications? And who is responsible for reporting on the data? Those are all three different jobs. The people who are creating the application could just be one person. It could be a software developer, or it could be broken out into many different developers, which is quite frankly, probably the case. You may have your front end developers who focus on the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript technologies, especially the new JavaScript frameworks and libraries like React, Angular, and Vue. Then you'll have your app tier developers. These again could be JavaScript developers who are focusing on Node.js, or they could be .NET developers who are focusing on C Sharp. And then lastly, you will have SQL developers. And as I said in the intro, this was one of my very first jobs in the tech world was a SQL and XML developer. I was developing interfaces that shared data from our database to other databases. We created ways that we could run queries, translate it into XML, and send it out to the other database, and we had to standardize those data flows too. So in this section of the screen, we are focusing primarily on developers. There is another role that comes into play. The developers are trying to make the app work, but who's going to maintain the database itself? Who is focused on getting sure that we have the maximum amount of throughput or performance in IOPS? Who is ensuring that the database is secure and encrypted? Who is ensuring that the database may have a replication or a replica and is always available? That is the database administrator or DBA for short. The DBA is responsible for the health and security of the database. They're the ones who are making sure that the database is backed up, it's available, it's encrypted, and that it's not overburdened by queries and it needs additional scaling. Then when we get into this side of the screen, this is where we get into our business intelligence architects or developers. These are the people who are focused on using tools like SSIS or NIME, to pull data out of the transactional databases, load the data warehouse, and then model the data so that it can be reported in pretty dashboards using Power BI or Tableau. So there's three different jobs here. We've got devs, which I see now that I've written with too many E's. We've got our DBAs who are responsible for the health of all databases. And then we have our business intelligence professionals who are responsible for the loading of the warehouse and the modeling or shaping of the data for analytics. 
Now again, I can't stress this enough, the entire point of the DevCore exam is choosing the right database for right here, the right database for your application. All of this stuff is, you know, just kind of lanyap at this point, but I wanted you to know that this is what is actually happening out there in the real world, and these are the different teams that are involved with the data estate. And they really are role-specific because there even used to be different certification exams for each one of these roles. When it came to Microsoft SQL Server product, there was a developer exam. There was a DBA exam. And I actually have that certification. And then there were analytics exams, which I have for Tableau. But there also was analytics exams for SSAS or SQL Server Analysis Services, as well as Power BI. All of the above, everything that you see on the screen, you can find training on right here at CBT Nuggets. Go ahead and search for Tableau or Power BI or SQL Server, and guess what you'll find? You'll find all of the developer, the SSIS, the SSAS, and all of the analytics tools here. So now you have a better understanding of what the data estate really means to an enterprise and a business, and what the networking needs would really be for each one of these applications or analytics platforms. So that's been setting up the real world of what's going on with databases. In the next seconds, we're gonna talk about the different kinds of databases that developers can use for their own application. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.